Yes, thank you. Uh, the title changed, and it got a question mark. Do worlds collide? Because the, 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 the interesting discipline about writing, of course, is that you uh, change your mind and you discover that the abstract that you put in some time ago doesn't, in fact, take you where you thought you'd go. Um, this also could uh, be, uh, to some extent, uh, an answer to Donald Clark, although I didn't know what he was going to say. Um, let me say straight away that uh, some of my best friends are physicists, um, that I think they're very good teachers, and that I like lectures. Um, I think this puts me in Donald's framework, impossibly in the category of both the criminal and the stupid. Um, but I can live with that um, and um, let you judge for yourself. Um, this also builds wonderfully on my colleague um, Helen Keegan's wonderful talk a little earlier in the session, and in fact, in her response to the very last question, uh, which was about what was she doing um, as a lecturer in computer science uh, dealing with creative content, which after all belongs to the discipline of art and design in the framework of our university. Um, and I think uh, that question and Helen's response really poses to me some of the questions that we need to think about, about the way that we use uh, digital technologies in teaching and learning as we try and take forward our ambitions to improve the quality uh, of learning and teaching in all of our institutions. Um, I want to start as far away as I can uh, from here uh, in Mali. Um, my, my background is in archaeology, by the way, um, and uh, so I've always been interested in, and in African archaeology. Uh, Mali is one of the world's earliest centers of learning, 700,000 scholarly manuscripts dating back to the 13th century, which really transformed the entire way that we've understood uh, the history of this part of uh, Africa. Uh, and of course, one of the great projects um, that's taken advantage uh, of the new technologies we have is the uh, now widely available digital copies uh, of those manuscripts, which in turn are changing the notion uh, of the scholarship of early Islamic writing. Um, and uh, in my work, and I do a certain amount of work in that part of the world, I had the opportunity recently of, of starting a conversation with a man called Abdullah Niang, uh, who works from Bamako in Malawi, um, and has established a foundation for sustainable development, uh, which in fact, as you'd expect, uh, depends um, overwhelmingly on a digital web-based platform. Let me say to Donald, by the way, in answer to his... Uh, his response to the question about whether there really is a digital divide, try going to Mali. Um, there certainly is a digital divide. And don't send anybody in Mali uh, any email attachment with a graphic uh, because it will take them about half an hour to download it with dial-up connections. Um, but clearly, and why I think Timbuktu is a very useful uh, example for us, is that the mythology of Timbuktu, the faraway place in the world, is now, of course, connected in uh, with these educational platforms. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later on in what I want to say. Rather improbably, I want to go from Timbuktu to Milton Keynes. Um, and, and, and what I've structured this here is a, is, 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 is a response to uh, a couple of very interesting presentations made by Martin Bean, the Vice Chancellor of the Open University. Um, uh, I encountered his particular presentation uh, at, at JISC. Seb's talked, uh, pointed out to me subsequently that in fact he uh, has made a similar presentation here at Alt. Uh, a very provocative and interesting uh, presentation that he, that he makes. And his argument, and many of you will have heard it, um, is that we are at a threshold uh, between uh, the formal learning structures of the past and the inf informal socially networked uh, world of the future. And I think that, to me, resonates with uh, the theme of a notion of a sea change and the question mark that's being asked as a theme through this session and this conference. And in Martin's phrasing, uh, and the quotations indicate that it comes from his presentation, um, it, he sees institutionally accredited learning as, as what he says, having a fixed granularity. Uh, and he juxtaposes this against informal learning, uh, which he says, and again from his presentation, is not accredited so much by institutions, but it's accredited by mentors and by the platforms themselves uh, on which it's delivered. In other words, by uh, a claim or comment um, from uh, people working within the same technology frame. Um, the, the key metaphor uh, that Martin Bean uses in this presentation is this uh, juxtaposition of clouds uh, and staircases. Um, and the concept of these clouds of inf informal uh, learning uh, colliding with the rich, thick, granular staircases, if you like, of formal accredited learning. And I want to take issue 
uh, with that presentation because I think he's wrong. Um, and I think we need to think around uh, that uh, particular juxtaposition that he poses here uh, to take us forward. And it's to some extent an extension of what he's saying because the interesting thing about Martin's very provocative presentation, at least the one that I heard with the clouds and staircase metaphor, is that's the point at which it stops. So rather like Donald this morning, there's no solution that follows on from this. There's no offer of what we should be doing differently once we've abolished the lecture, once we've abolished the university, once we've abolished the lecture theatre, abandoned all of the buildings and taken resort uh, to our uh, mobile devices. There isn't a clear model here of exactly what education is going to look like. And I think we, we have a cul-de-sac here in this representation that doesn't help us move forward. Um, some issues that, I, that I'd want to put up here. Um, I, I apologize for, for, for the quality of um, uh, my PowerPoint here. Frank put me to shame. Um, I, I got carried away in preparing for this because it was a challenging brief. Uh, so um, I wrote rather a long paper and mercifully I made the decision not to read it out in front of you giving the comments this morning because that would have been an embarrassing position to have been in, wouldn't it? Um, uh, but I have uh, uh, the, the whole written text of the paper would, would, is, is available through Alt and it's on my website. Um, uh, and so anyway, I put together the PowerPoint and the bit fuzzy graphics because I stole these off um, Amazon and they didn't come out so well. Um, but basically, the notion, first of all, I want to put in front is that we need to give attention to content before we give attention to technology. And that's been mentioned by a number of people here uh, for the simple reason that our capacity always extends ahead of us, um, uh, either through the Moore's Law's process of the accelerating capacity uh, of the technology or through the expansion of bandwidth that we have available. And so what we tend to find is that digital content is inherent, invariably slow and inherently unsatisfactory. And a number of people have made that comment in the session. That's the phenomenon uh, where uh, we are always working uh, with this wonderful machinery that can basically run a spaceship, but we use about 5% of its capacity. And we all have that experience of the devices that we use. Very few of us actually catch up with what our technology that we, 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 we have can do. And that, in my experience, I mean, my, 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 my earliest work in, in using information technology was um, at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, where I worked for a long time before uh, uh, moving to Salford. Uh, I went there on account of the weather. Um, but the, 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 um, my experience there in, in, in back in, in that environment, in, 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 in again, moving into using information technology in the early to mid 80s, is that we were always behind the ability uh, of the technology. And there are a number of, 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 of useful uh, literature connection points on this which help us to understand that. I always find Manuel Castell's work on the information age, the, the, the huge trilogy that he wrote in the 90s, uh, very interesting to help us to understand why that is, why that's a phenomenon of the world that we live in. Um, and another text that's important to me, and I'm going to touch on this um, uh, 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 in a minute, is, is Dominic Ferre's work on the economics of knowledge. And a key distinction for what I want to say next is the distinction between tacit knowledge and codified knowledge, which will be familiar to many of you. So hold on to that idea then, that, that in, in my argument here, that we must really put content for technology. Here's a key distinction, which I, help, I think helps uh, unravel that issue uh, and take the sort of very interesting train of thought that Martin Bean's taken us on a little bit further. A key distinction which helps me to understand this. Um, the different terminology here, I'm, I'm using Foray's definition, there are other words that are used, but tacit knowledge is the sort of knowledge that's immediate exploratory. Um, classically, uh, and this of course is way outside the frame of digital technology, uh, learning through tacit knowledge is via apprenticeships. It's a sort of face-to-face -face learning experience uh, where knowledge is passed on uh, between people immediately. And there are all sorts of ways though in which tacit knowledge works in the academy. Um, advanced scientific laboratories, classic example of tacit knowledge. Ideas are, fro are thrown around between people in the research team be before they're codified. Some are rejected, some are accepted. Um, and that, 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 if you like, is at one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum is what we can call codified knowledge. And these are the highly structured uh, forms of knowledge um, that are used for mass communication and exchange. And of course, the printing press and the book is the key example. Frank had some very interesting examples of that in those various technological revolutions uh, that have gone through education, uh, through Xerox machines, into photocopiers, uh, that, 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 that sort of technology. Um, the ultimate in codified knowledge would be something like Einstein's equation, expressing something in a, in a single line. 
Um, and the experience, of course, of what Manuel Castells would call our information age is this massive expansion of codified knowledge through digital modes of communication. The problem that our students face today is not the problem of getting the train fare or the airfare to go to a library to find the resources uh, for their research. It's making uh, discriminating decisions and choices between the immense mass of information that they have in front of them. And that's a very different skill set. And so I think what, 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 what has come about for those of us whose careers have extended back beyond what Castells would call the information age is that's the great change, this massive extension, expansion of codified knowledge. Um, so what I'd argue here is that the technologies of the information age have changed the nature and relationship between both codified um, and tacit knowledge. I've mentioned already how codified knowledge has been massively expanded. Um, but of course, tacit knowledge, and this is key to what I want to argue here, has also been very significantly extended by ubiquitous social networking platforms. So email, Facebook, um, Second Life, YouTube, Twitter. I have a great claim to fame, by the way. I'm said to be the first vice chancellor to Twitter, and I think I'm still one of only three. Uh, I, I'm hoping that Times uh, Higher Education is going to entrench that um, uh, as a matter of fact for the archive. Um, but um, when I started doing this, people th thought this was a, a, a completely crazy. Um, we did it primarily to try uh, and break one of the most difficult things in academic leadership, uh, where you're privileged to be leading an institution of about 20,000 people, which is keeping in touch with your own people internally, let alone the rest of the world. And that's one of the most difficult challenges one faces. But I think we'd all agree that um, social networking platforms have, again, simply changed the way that they've, we, we, we worked. Um, certainly in environments like these. I mean, it might not be happening right at the moment, and I'm not looking behind me, but I have certainly found, almost every time I speak now, um, I will find myself in the front here talking like this, and projected on the screen uh, will be a Twitter feed uh, 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 telling all of you what everybody out there actually thinks about what I'm saying, and that's an extremely confusing environment to work in. Uh, but it's one, of course, uh, which is really a classic example of that tacit immediate knowledge uh, that's being passed around, and we well know we know these platforms well. We tend to forget, of course, because we take it for granted, uh, that the very first use of email was overwhelmingly by the international academic community, uh, exactly as a form of immediate tacit knowledge exchange. And then the other key point, again, obviously uh, a given for a conference like this, is that um, interoperability with mobile devices is freeing us from the technology of the desk and the chair. In other words, we're, we're freed uh, from the constraints of where we are physically. Again, very disconcerting um, for those of you who actively teach using social media, because of course, unless you're in some sort of video, you, you don't really know uh, where or who you're actually speaking to anymore. And there was a famous punch cartoon of a number of years ago, which I wish I'd kept, uh, but I didn't. Uh, with a, a, a picture of a dog sitting behind a computer. And it said, basically, the great advantage of the internet is that nobody knows you're a dog. Um, and uh, uh, that is, again, changes the nature of the way that we, 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 we communicate. So, question. Staircases and clouds. Are these different forms of communication, then, uh, part uh, of uh, a collision? And I thought they were when I started writing this paper. This is why I had to put question mark back in the title. Um, are these, in fact, worlds colliding? Is social networking clouds confronting the rigid hierarchical word of learning? Um, I uh, think not. And I think that the better way of looking at it is in that third bullet point there. And that is to begin to think of open content as codified knowledge and social networking as not inherently tacit knowledge. And let me just amplify a little bit on that. This has not come out at all. Um, this is Kolb's classic experiential learning cycle that will be known uh, to many of you here. Um, and it's this um, constant virtuous circle between concrete experience, reflective observation, abstract conceptualization, and active experimentation. And many people here will have known this either directly or indirectly, in thinking about creating rich learning ex ex experiences uh, for our students. And what interested me here was that, of course, Kolb was writing back in the early 1980s before any of this was even imagined. 
back in the early 1980s. I think we were using Apple IIs with 64Ks, and we were completely delighted that we could put a six-figure code before and after a word, and it was magically underlined. And Bill Gates really did say, I believe 64K should be enough for anybody. Um, Kolb certainly, I don't think, imagined uh, this sort of uh, world. And, and what's interested me is how we can take this notion of experiential learning and, 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 and use it to look at this distinction um, between what I'm calling codified and uh, tacit knowledge and the different forms that that takes in um, the use of uh, digital content. So if we look at the the experiential learning in a digital environment. Um, we have four stages in the cycle, as I've already mentioned, concrete experience, reflective observation, abstract conceptualization, active experimentation. And what I'm arguing here is that in ideal learning environments and the sorts of learning environments that we are finding productive, each one of those stages will actually use a combination of tacit and codified knowledge, ranging from informal discussion through written text to abstract, highly codified formulations. In other words, in each stage, all forms of digital technology can enhance and extend the learning experience. We shouldn't be pitting um, formal content against informal content as if there's that uh, precise sort of equation. And in talking to a lot of people who are really interesting practitioners uh, in this respect, uh, we can see how those sorts of things come together. Now, I haven't had the opportunity to talk more to Helen about her, 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 her presentation this morning. One of the interesting things about all the institutions we work in is we might work in the same institution inside of each other's buildings, but we have to have a, come to a conference uh, at the other part of the country to figure out what we're uh, respectively doing. Um, but that serves as a very good example, and had I known about it, I would have used it here, because, of course, uh, constructing um, a, a very rich student learning opportunity uh, through the challenge uh, of making films uh, 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 using, uh, um, uh, using the video devices in mobile phones is the learning content appropriating and using the whole, um, the whole range of social networking type technologies. But of course, that is work that has been submitting for, as part of a formal structure for accreditation, for examination, for credit that's actually given uh, within the formal environment of the university. It doesn't step aside from it. It's not a cloud uh, uh, colliding with a staircase. It's, in fact, a different way of conceptualizing uh, the clever use of digital technologies. So going back then to um, Abdoulaye, the Abdoulaye Foundation, Abdoulaye Nyang's work, um, and again, this is an example of, of many that one could choose, and I'm just using the rhetorical device here, of uh, using Mali as a nice faraway place. Um, it was uh, really, really interesting talking to this man. I w the, the encounter was, I, I, I've been doing some work in Dakar and Senegal, and uh, he and I were on a jury together, interestingly enough, uh, uh, judging um, 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 awards for um, new innovative programs in learning. And talking to him um, in Dakar about his passion for what he wanted to bring uh, into uh, Mali really brought home to me how these sorts of technologies um, are changing uh, the way that we, we do things. So when he constructs his vision of what this future is, he's constructing a vision of a learning platform that totally combines structured content that's delivered in a digital way, content that will be equivalent to MIT or the Open University's open content, uh, which is formally structured, accredited type learning structure. He envisages a situation where he takes those sorts of, uh, of, of, of formal parts of what he wants to do and completely combines them with the sort of social networking technology that's essential to his vision because he's dealing with vast distances, with no roads, um, with no fixed line technology, where his dependence on reaching his learners will depend entirely on the availability of social networking technology. And the two uh, come together uh, in that framework in a common um, sort of uh, uh, way of doing things and delivering. So, to tie up then, what I'm suggesting in really trying to take forward this important strand of conversation that's now running through a number of these sorts of conferences uh, through very thoughtful presentations uh, by people like Martin Bean, and of course, the Open University plays such an important role uh, in this respect. My suggestion is that 
rather than thinking about these worlds being in collision. Um, what the real potential is, is that digital technologies allow a massive extension of the full range of knowledge dissemination from immediate to the highly abstract. I've used the example uh, of Mali as a rhetorical advice, advice because it's a long way away and because it's somewhere near Timbuktu, which we all think of the other side of the world. But it's also, in my part of the world, in, 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 in the Northwest, we're also dealing there with generations of social exclusion uh, from um, uh, higher education opportunities, very dissimilar to the sorts of parts of Islington that we've just uh, heard about earlier. And the huge potential, I think, um, of these extensions of the full range of knowledge dissemination go to extending access to learning in these sorts of ways as well. Um, I do think that we have to put the epistemology of what we do, such as exp experiential learning theory, which I happen to like and which I've used, um, but there are other epistemological approaches. There's certainly critiques of exper experiential learning theory that need to be taken very seriously. But whatever they are, I think they have to be put before the technology so that we can actually free the full potential of uh, that digital communication and realize uh, what we can do with it. And I'll stop at that point. Thank you very much indeed. I should just say that uh, your paper is also available on Crowdvine. I noticed okay. you've linked it to your session, so that's a very easy place to get it. And I would strongly recommend that you do download it and read it. it I think it's a paper that uh, few vice chancellors will probably read, and even fewer would have, could have written, but it's well worth <laughs> the effort. Um, can we have some questions from the floor, please? Roving mics, if you start down the front. Hello, one of the themes you, you included, Martin, was that some discussion of open content. Mm. Uh, if I heard you correctly, at one stage you seem to align open content with being codified knowledge. Mm. I wondered whether um, that was because you felt that the process of making content open was necessarily one of codification, or whether you felt that tacit knowledge couldn't be presented in the form of open content. Because shortly after that, you also mm. said that one of the first uses of, of, of email was by mm. academics to share tacit knowledge. And I couldn't quite in my mind fit that mm. kind of comment with the notion that open content couldn't be in some way tacit knowledge. No, thank you. Um, that's a good point, and I, 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 I should tighten that definition of it up a little bit, because you're right, it becomes a bit confusing. W what I was meaning in this context uh, by, by open content was very, very much with an O and a C in a formal sense, um, in terms of what has now become a movement with Open University, MIT, Oxford, other people, um, making available their formal curriculum without charge um, or without registration requirements to, 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 to anybody who, who will take it. And I think we now have a sufficient number of very strong institutional precedents to have something out there which is a bit of a, a movement and a phenomenon. Um, and not in the broad sense, because you're absolutely right, of course. The, the, the issue of open access as opposed to open content you must certainly you can make available any form of knowledge, including tacit knowledge sh sharing openly, and I would very strongly advocate that, and that would extend to institutions that would want to put um, open repositories in the centre of what they do, which is the case that we do at the University of Salford. But the reason why I think that, 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 that I, the, the reason why I want to put open content, including very particularly the open universities' open content on the structured side, is because its very appeal is to me that it's, it's codified and organised um, it, is, it is part of those staircases in Martin's formulation that will eventually lead to um, a qualification. There's also a very strong implication in open content that you've got to access it sequentially um, because you would then move through the formal sequence of a, of, a, of a formal curriculum because there's certain things in a formal curriculum that you've got to know one before the other. And what I'm suggesting is that we need to see that as structured. And that's its value for me. That's its immense value. Thank you. Um, in the middle here. Uh, Derek Morrison, Higher Education Academy. Um, something that's exercised my mind for years is the, the, the whole concept of lock-in, mm. um, of, of wax lyrical since about certainly 2004, about 
the idea of e-learning filling stations. And we're at the rough equivalent of how early motoring used to be, where you couldn't just pop into your local garage. You mm. actually had to go to you know, either your equivalent of your local pharmacy or, or, or specific type of filling station. Mm. But yeah, I see several times today, I've actually seen the assertion about, particularly in the mobile arena, that the liberalization of content via mobile devices. But yet, well, where I'm, I'm sitting and uh, thinking about in terms of things like iTunes U mm. and, and the way that Amazon behaves with Kindle, um, the, 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 if, if anything, if not specifically at the content level, at the service delivery of that content level, there's an even more ominous approach to actually locking in a dependency that is positively unhealthy. So when I actually see mm. about the liberalization and interoperability, mm. then I think particularly the likes of e-books, and I think about the, the debate between um, uh, Apple uh, and, and uh, Adobe regarding whether there should be Flash or, or, or not. We, we still seem to be allowing ourselves to do exactly the opposite of liberalizing content. We seem hell-bent on, on actually getting ourselves locked into services. Well, um, absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the, the Amazon relationship with, with, with Kindle is a good one, but I mean, c c consider this. If you ask anybody at MIT what their return is on the massive upfront investment that they've put for open content, they'll tell you that the availability of open content has massively increased demand for the formal registration of their courses, and therefore their ability to, pay, to charge up to 40,000 US dollars a year of people to register. Now, I mean, let me declare an interest straight away. I mean, I'm in charge of a university. We're dependent on student fees. Um, that's lock-in, uh, because the thing that we still own that is not owned out there is the right to award the qualification. And as long as you have the right to award your qualification, uh, then you are locking in your learners. And it would be dishonest, dishonest for any, anybody um, who runs a higher education institution to say that, that doesn't matter. I mean, we're not giving away our qualifications. We're giving away our content. We charge for our qualifications, whether we charge learners or whether we receive uh, a, 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 a subsidy or government grant, that's our income source. So I think you're absolutely right. Thank you. We've got a question at the back. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Claire Killen, I'm, I'm pondering here. It's not about content. To me, it's about um, learning experiences. And what I'm wondering is when we're in a world where there is so much content now available and, and mm. we know so much from all the various research programs, and there is more choice being talked about. Choice. The government is pushing choice, but are learners ready for it? I'm not mm -hmm. saying they're not capable of it, but are they ready for it? And what are we doing, looking to the future, which was the question asked at the end of Frank's session, what are we doing to help prepare them for this choice, to help them access the resources? Mm -hmm. And I don't mean physical access. Mm -hmm. There are so many things we can do in the design of the learning experiences we create that will help them achieve their potential as autonomous learners, but I'm not seeing that coming out. Yeah, um, I, I think that is right. Um, <clears throat> there is a huge amount of choice, um, and I think, I think the degree of um, discretion and rationality behind choices varies very much according to the nature of the learner uh, and, 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 and what they're, they're looking for. I mean, I think that older learners, and particularly those who are taking up the opportunity to return to education, are, are, are very discriminating indeed um, in the choices that they make um, and will seek the best sort of information. I don't think that they're well served. I mean, there is a notion that somehow or other the market will create perfect information. I don't think markets do create perfect information. Um, and I'm not convinced that one has the information available to make those, 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 those sorts of choices. Um, I, I think when it comes to younger learners, and we see this through the application patterns that we have to our universities, um, I think that the, and we know in fact from our marketing departments that the basis on which uh, uh, younger learners make decisions about universities are often very alarming indeed, um, and are not really based on any 
uh, a particular sound notion of what the educational offering is. It will be the perception of the nature of the city. Uh, it will be whether it's a party city or not a party city, what the reputation of it actually is, and a whole variety of other factors. So I don't think that we are doing enough in putting out uh, genuine information um, about uh, 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 what those options are. We are, of course, in, 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 in enslaved by the league tables in, 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 in that respect. Um, and uh, that is probably about the most insidious part of, 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 of what we're faced with, partly because, of course, league tables generalize across an entire university and say nothing at all about the specific course that somebody might be interested in, and also because they drive um, a very simple linear notion of the organization of opportunities. But I think the implication of your question is completely correct, and that is that, that, that we're not matching the openness in access um, to content and information with the sort of tools that people need to make a choice in often a very confusing, confusing and bewildering way of opportunities. Okay. Just one very quick question here. Can you keep it short as we're up against time? Thank you. Certainly, I'll, I'll try and do my best. Nigel Ecclesfield. It strikes me when, when you talked about um, social networking not inherently creating tacit knowledge, mm. Martin, that there is some work from Caroline Haythornthwaite at the University of British Columbia from an information processing, information science aspect where she's looked at the formation of groups in social networking environments and at learning mm. societies and makes that very distinction you're making in, that in a sense within a social networking mm. environment issues are single issues for those groups who mm. aggregate and move apart very quickly whereas in a group like Alt th there needs to be more commitment both to yeah. the individuals within the group and the issue in order to, for the knowledge to become tacit and circulate yeah. in the way that you've described. Yes, no, thank you. I think that's right. I mean, I think that, that we, again, the over-categorization of, if we say, for instance, that for some th something like a platform like Facebook is inevitably uh, a social networking tacit knowledge content, I, I think we actually miss the point about the way that a lot of people are using a platform like Facebook for exactly those sorts of special interest things. And if one looks at the way that that is used in Facebook, you're finding what in my book are, are, are much more codified f forms of knowledge and become very interesting from that point of view and very interesting ways of organizing uh, and disseminating that sort of information. I think one of the key things, and, and again it would be pretty well common cause here, is of course the sort of interoperability that allows us to move across these sorts of uh, different platforms and different opportunities in a way that allows to, 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 to produce and generate very smart educational solutions.